श्री राम जय राम जय जय राम ओम ते राम जय राम जय जय राम ओम ते राम जय राम जय जय राम ओम श्री राम जय राम जय जय राम ओम श्री राम जय राम जय जय राम ओम श्री राम जय राम जय जय राम ओम आई बाउ टू राम आई बाउ टू गॉड आई बाउ टू एम एन ऑल ऑफ यू You know, a wonderful thing about the Hindu religion is that they see God in everything. And the usual teaching I know in Christianity, they say, oh no, he's God. Well, but who are you? What did he make you out of? You are not something that, that came into existence apart from him. You cannot be condemned for eternity to hell. This is a terrible teaching. My guru one time... Uh, He, he was visiting a farmhouse up north in America, and the farmer was a fundamentalist Christian. He said, we're all sinners. We will all go to hell. The master thought, well, I'd like to disabuse him of this terrible idea. I mean, what a thing to look forward to. And uh, he said, do you, do you have a son? Yes, yes, I do. He's a disappointment to me, isn't he? Oh, is he ever a disappointment? He's just... He's always carousing, and I just hope something comes of him. I hope he does well. I said, well, my guru said, I have a cure for him. Oh, anything you can do, I'll be so grateful to him, uh, to you. He said, um, just tell me, what can I do? Well, my master said, uh, do you have a good strong rope? What are you trying to get at? No, no, just I'm trying to help you. Well, yeah, I have a strong rope. Do you have a large oven? Wait a minute, what are you trying? I'm just, I'm just trying to help you. Well, yeah, I have a strong, a large oven. He said, well, I'll tell you what you do. When your son comes home next time drunk, tie him up and shove him in the oven. No, oh, blasphemer, how can you talk that way? My own son, I'd never dream of. I just said, okay, you wouldn't do it to your son. Do you think your heavenly father would do it to you? <coughs> He loves you more than you can possibly love your son. And the man said, thank you, I've learned something. Well, that idea that God can only be somewhere up in the heavens and that we are just doomed little creatures, this thought that we're doomed to hell unless we happen to choose some right path, it's sort of like a, a lottery game, for heaven's sake. You just choose the right number on a roulette table and you win and you jump up and down and all the other people lose. Is that what it's like? It's just sometimes the mythology that grows up around religion is just so ludicrous as to make you want to laugh, except sometimes it makes you feel like weeping because people condemn themselves to so much pain in the simple thought of what is waiting for them. And they're li always living in the thought that God is getting angry with them. How can God get angry with you? He is your own self. If he's angry, he's angry from within that you've done wrong and you're hurting yourself. That's why he's angry. You can't hurt him in the heavens, but you can hurt the God within you if you do things that are not harmonious with that divine presence. If you act harshly, if you act cruelly, if you hurt people, you certainly will suffer because they are a part of you. And most people think, well, I'm not suffering, they're suffering. Yes, something inside you will suffer. And karma will come out in the end. But you know, karma is really just like a boil. You don't get a boil unless there's an impurity in your own system. Finally, it's coming out and you lance the boil and you get rid of that impurity. But that impurity is there. The bad karma is there and it's holding you down. I remember a young man wanted to come and join the monastery when I was living with my guru and My guru surprised all of us because he seemed so eager. My guru wouldn't accept him. And um, Somebody said to Master, but he seemed so good. Master said, if you could just see the karma, 
He could see our karma. He could see all the things that we have done. He could see who was ready. It was not the right time for that person. But what you will do if you live in that sense of inner peace and presence and peace of God, then you will see that bit by bit, even when bad karma comes, and it has to come, don't say, why me? Be grateful that it came. Be grateful because you can learn lots of lessons. And sometimes the supreme lesson, after all, what is it? Death, isn't it? And so people are afraid of death. But it will come sooner or later. You can't get away from it. Wouldn't it be a good thing to prepare for it? No. So that even when you die, you will greet it as a friend. And not, no, 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 just give it just a few more seconds, just a few more minutes. <laughs> People fight death. And that's the one battle they can never win. I'd like to read a little short story from my guru's life. And uh, then we'll go on. Dr. Lewis told us this story, quote, I was called away from the Master's presence one Sunday evening to the telephone. To my serious concern, I learned that my daughter, Brenda, had just been stricken with convulsions. When the Master heard this, he stepped briefly behind a screen. A few moments later, he emerged, smiling. I remember Dr. Lewis describing it and rubbing his hands like this. I didn't write that in the book. Don't worry, doctor, he told me. She will be all right. Confidently, he added, and she will never have another one. Brenda was completely cured. Moreover, she has never had another seizure. Well, these things can come. You can be going along feeling perfectly well, and all of a sudden, something terrible can happen. Illness, yes, you can die like that. You never know. When you wake up in the morning, you never know whether you'll see the see evening and see nightfall and sleep. And so you think, because it's gone on for a long time and it hasn't happened, it'll never happen. Look around you. There's just about almost nobody on this planet today who will be here in another hundred years. So don't think of yourself as an exception. Of course you know you won't be. So think of the self. Think of yourself rather. Here's what I've found a very good practice when I'm taking my shower, my bath, I, as I wash my body with water and soap, I think someday this will be ashes or dust. It will be nothing. This arm, which I prize, which I don't really prize that much, but people do, it won't be yours. Everything. It's a good practice. Don't think, oh, what a gloomy thought. What's so gloomy about death? You've died millions of times already, and here you are still. You aren't this body. You created this body sort of like a hermit crab. But the real you lives inside this shell. That isn't who you are. The thing is that if you live in the thought of God, as Sri Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, those who worship the lower gods go to them. Those who worship me come to me. And those who don't worship at all um, go somewhere else. But that's also temporary. There's no such thing as a permanent hell. In fact, there's a, you're in hell right now if you are disharmonious in your own thoughts. This is hell. Honestly, I can't imagine a worse hell than having a, an ego. Because whatever you do, it's always so limited. What happens to this one little ego? What this one little ego can do? Don't you know that your true self lives in all selves? Now, those masters who are in all beings, those masters who feel their consciousness everywhere. Certainly they feel their suffering, yes. But they feel it with that, they feel it with the consciousness of the soul. So that although those people are writhing in pain, it isn't as if the master needed to writhe in pain. Sometimes as an example to the disciples, he will do so like that beautiful story in Autobiography of a Yogi when Lahiri Maharaja was speaking and all of a sudden was gasping for air. And he said, I'm drowning in the souls of many people off the coast of Japan. And in the newspaper the next day, this came out in the headlines that there had been a great sh ship uh, uh, sea disaster and many souls had been drowned when the ship went down. But yes, the master can feel that on that human level if he chooses to, either uh, as an example to others or for uh, what other, whatever other obscure reason he may have. And of course... Their reasons are very obscure. 
Maybe he was with them physically in a way, helping them. Who knows? The life of a master is mysterious, to say the least. Don't even try to understand it. I didn't. I was very surprised when, at one time, Lori Pratt, Yogananda's chief disciple, the uh, chief editor, said to me, "I every time I think I've understood Master, I realize he's much more." And I couldn't help thinking, "Well, I've never tried to understand him. It seems just beyond. How can you understand the infinite? How can you understand an ocean? You just do your best to learn how to swim. You do your best to cope with what little realities you have." facing you right now, but you'll never understand the Master. Nevertheless, they are aware of all this suffering. They're aware of it intimately. At the same time, they see it from the soul level, and your soul cannot suffer. Sri so Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita says the true self cannot be burned, cannot be blown away, cannot be drowned. The self is untouched by the body. That is your true being. So when death comes, it will be, for a moment, painful, but the pain is only mental. Once you cross over, suddenly there is peace. How many people have actually discovered that by their own experience? They've gone out of the body, let's say, when their heart stopped, or some, for some reason they, they uh, were not physically uh, alive, and yet inwardly they, they looked down and saw the operators, the, the surgeons operating on the body, in one case that I read about, they said later, because the body had been in another room uh, and before it came back to life, and he described that room. And there was one funny one in one of the books that I've read, because I've read a number, it's fun to read these things, that uh, she told her brother that she had seen him coming into the hospital. Oh, you couldn't have seen me. She said, yes, you said that all the old girl's going to kick the bucket, it looks like. And he was very embarrassed to have uh, to have her know that he had actually used that expression. But the thing is that you aren't touched by that. And so don't cling to it even now. A very good thing to concentrate on is death. And I do not mean it in a negative way. Because the experience of death in the end is a very positive one. And the more you live in God, the more positive it is. You go into a beautiful light. The astral world is so much more beautiful than this world. It's, uh, you know, even as a child, it seemed to be more real than this world. But it's temporary. That's the point. Sooner or later, until you have attained freedom completely from desires for this world, you'll have to come back here and go through the same old grind. There's a, a beautiful saying in the Rubat of Omar Khayyam, which my guru explained, and when you read the explanation, you see, oh yes, that's what it, it clearly means. But uh, it's saying that many souls at the beginning of the manifestation of God in the day of Brahma, many souls that, are, that come out at that time into manifestation are still wandering in delusion at the end of the day of Brahma and the beginning of the night of Brahma when all things are withdrawn back into the spirit again. Why wander that long? Just think of the billions of years this means. Be in yourself. Even that simple thought of how often you have gone through it, how often you've tried to make a million and tried to get a beautiful wife and, well, she will get old someday or she will die before you even have a chance to enjoy your relationship or something will happen uh, she can betray you. This world is so insecure. Don't expect perfection in anything, because as soon as you put that beautiful shandesh to your mouth, it suddenly crumples like a flower and becomes nothing. Not literally, I don't mean it literally. Surely you get to enjoy that bit of shandesh or that sweet, but for how long? And you try to enjoy too much, and oh, the pains in your stomach. There's always a uh, down after every up, just like a hangover after drinking. There's always a hangover for every joy. It will, be re it will be reflected in a pain. Every fulfillment has to lead to an ultimate failure. Every victory will become a disappointment. It just can't be helped. You cannot say, now this wave is so high, now stay there, stay there, stay there. It will not stay there. 
That is not the na nature of water. The wave can crest and then it will go down again and become a drop. Your life is like that. There's just nothing you can do against it or about it. People think, finally, I've made my millions. And then they die of cancer. And what could their millions do for them? And I told you this story once of seeing a group of beggars outside Howrah Station in Bengal. And there was this one who, obviously, she had her hand out because that's what all her people were doing. It, But you could see in her attitude that she was thinking, what am I doing? And she looked like a queen having to do something that was so totally incompatible with what she felt ought to be her nature. Well, it's because in her last life she was selfish. She thought only in terms of what I can get, not in terms of what I can give. You know, England rose to a peak, and then what happened? They were only thinking of taking from countries. They weren't giving back to them. As a result, my guru told me England's karma is finished. And it's nothing big. It'll happen all the time. The one thing wonderful about India that separates it from all the ancient cultures, because India put God first, because there were enough people in India who loved God, enough rishis who communed with him and became one with him, India, in spite of all its suffering, in spite of invasions and poverty and so on, India still is. And India is now coming up again. But remember that what made it come up is because it put God first. Don't forget him. Don't think, well, that's in the future. I've got this right now to deal with. Somebody came to me in the hospital when I had pneumonia a few months ago and asked me, how can I manage, how can I f be dharmic, how can I follow the path of dharma when I have a son to put through college and I, uh, I can't be completely truthful or completely honest and make ends meet. And I said to him, you know, there's a saying, yata dharma, tata jaya, it's the truth. You will be more successful if you are dharmic than you can possibly be if you aren't. And even if you go against dharma and by some fluke of nature, because you have the good karma anyway, you will be successful. And you will attribute that success to the fact that you lied to this person and cheated that person. No. The time will come when that karma will catch up with you. You can't, it can't be different. So learn to live in this world without any fear. Live in God, and death itself will be your friend. Joy to you. No green summer fade and winter draw near. My Lord, in your presence, I live without fear. Through tempest, through snow, Dancers with